Okay, Bokir Tov, welcome everybody. Continuing our study of Shemuel Bet, we're up to Perek He, chapter five. In the Saks Hebrew English, it's page 727. Towards the top of the page, you'll hear, you'll see uh, Perek He, Pasuk Aleph. Um, today's class will be Lilu Nishmat Esther Bat Sara. Um, so to catch us up, last we saw that um, Ish Boshet, who was the son of Shaul, who was placed by Avner into this puppet regime, was assassinated. He was killed. David wasn't happy with it. He didn't condone it. But nevertheless, with Ish Boshet out of the way, it paves the way for David to accomplish what he's been trying to do for the last several uh, chapters, which is unite the kingdom under his rule, as was prophesied and promised to him by Hashem. And so now that Ishboshet is gone, David will see that to fruition. And that's where we begin on Perek He, uh, Pasuk Aleph, with the people of Hebron and the tribes coming together and saying, David, we recognize you as the king. And what are some of David's first things that he does now that he's been widely uh, recognized as the true king of the Jewish people? All of the tribes of Israel Come to David, whose base has been in Hebron. Hebron is in the territory of Yehuda, where David's tribe, uh, where, he, where he was from. And they say to him, David, you are our guy. You are our flesh and blood. We're with you. We're here for you. Whether it was before yesterday or the day before that, even long before this, when Shaul was king over us, you were the one who brought the Jewish people out, brought them in, you fought battles with us. Remember David, even when Shaul was king, was a major general, and he was the one who was fighting on the front lines with the Jewish people. And God had said to you that you would be the shepherd of my nation of Israel, and that you would going, you're going to be um, the leader of the Jewish people, the king of Bnei Israel. Uh, Nagid is the one who's uh, from the like word like lahagid, like to speak to us, but to lead us when it comes to that. Yeah. Um, I wanted to see how he translates exactly the idea of Nagid. He says, all along, even when Shaul was king over us, you were the one who led Israel out and back. And the Lord said to you, you shall be a shepherd of my people, and you shall be the ruler. So Nagid, you want to say, is a ruler. Then the elders of the Jewish people approach El HaMelech Hevrona. They come to the king in Hevron. David establishes a covenant with the elders of the Jewish people in Hevron. And they once again anoint David as the king over Israel. So we've seen David go through stages, right? First, it was only his people. Then it was... Uh, First, it was only the ones, his, his immediate people who were rebelling against Shaul. Then it was the people in Hebron. Now it's all of the Jewish people. So as David has gone further and further to be recognized by more and more people, finally the elders come, everybody comes, and now David has been crowned as the unquestionable king of the Jewish people. You can see in these Pesukim, the Jewish people list three different reasons why they feel David should be the king for, uh, for them. He's, they say, first of all, that you are our flesh and blood, right? That you are a part of us, right? The idea that you're a member of the Jewish people, you're somebody who fought alongside of us. You are, you were the one who took us in and brought us out. But then finally, perhaps the most important thing of, of, of all of it um, was the idea that Hashem promised you that you were going to be king. So they sort of escalate to the reasons why they've adopted David as their king, the most important of which was, we're accepting the fact that Hashem promised it to you. And since you are the divinely appointed ruler, we are now giving you and pledging our allegiance to you. So this is very exciting for us. As the reader, we finally have some stability. Since Shaul uh, missed the, you know, did his few mistakes, we really haven't had a stable monarchy uh, with David and Shaul contending, and then even after Shaul passed away, Shaul's children contending. Finally, we have an undisputed king, and maybe we're ready to now step forward into a more uh, brighter 
more, a more bright period of Jewish history. And for that, the Pesukim really do illustrate David taking on his, and founding his kingdom. So now you'll see the next Pesukim from here to the end of the chapter are all going to talk about what David does uh, to establish a firm grip on the monarchy. Ben Shaloshim Shana David Bemolcho. David was 30 years old when he took over as king. Arbaim Shana Malach. And he ruled for 40 years, which means his entire lifespan was 70 years. Behevron, by the way, and that's a significant number. We know that the number 70 is like a sort of round number, right? It was 70 years between the destruction of the first Beit HaMikdash and the second Beit HaMikdash. It's like a standard lifetime. David himself says, um, Right, Yemesh Notenu Bahem Shivim Shana in Tehilim chapter 90, I think it is, right? Yeah, he says, Yemesh Notenu Bahem Shivim Shana, that the standard years of a person's life, 70 years. The Im Bichvorot, if a person is very strong and is really, a, a, you know, a, an entitled individual, 80 years, Shmonim Shana, right? So David himself lived 70 years. There's interesting midrashim all about this. They say that David's 70 years were given to him from Adam Harishon. And if you look at the first man, Adam Harishon, he lived 930 years. And the rabbis say he was really supposed to live a thousand years. But when he saw in the future to David, he took 70 years of his own life and he gave them to David so that David could, could live and prosper and, and become, the, become the king. What the connection is between the first man, Adam Harishon and David, requires maybe a, a little bit more investigation, a little bit more analysis, but might be beyond the scope of what we're doing here. If we have time, maybe we'll come back to it or think a little bit about it out loud. So um, David, it becomes king at age 30 and he rules till he's 70 when he passes away for 40 years. In that 40 year period, it was divided. If you look at verse five, Bechevron Malach al Yehuda Sheva Shanim Veshisha Chodashim, in Hebron, he ruled for seven years and six months. And in Yerushalayim, which is going to be the topic of the remainder of the chapter, how he moves the monarchy to the city of Yerushalayim, was for 33 years over all of Israel and the tribe of Yehuda. You always notice how Yehuda is like, yeah, on its own. A, in this situation, because they're David's flesh and blood, that's where David comes from. But always the people of Yehuda looked at, at themselves as a little bit more elite than the rest of the than the rest of all of the other uh, uh, tribes. That's where the kings are going to come from. So they always kind of separated themselves. They would often fight first in battle. They would lead everybody out. They were, you know, a little bit higher up um, on this on the on the ladder than than everybody else. And the text kind of puts that in there. So it's why no coincidence when later on in Jewish history the kingdom splits. It's Yehuda together with Binyamin on one side and everybody else kind of on the other side. We'll keep that in mind as the chapter goes when, along. Yeah. When it says that he was 30 and when he became king, that's, that's from this point, not from when he was originally. No, that's when he was from, oh, when he was like when the promise of Hashem. It begins at the seven years when he's crowned in Hebron. That's when the 40 years begins, when he's crowned in Hebron, which is... Now, or that's what that was... And it's not now. This part he's being... This is when he was accepted at the end of the seven years over all of the Jewish people, right? So for seven years, when David was crowned earlier on, right? When was it? It was right after Shaul's death, right? So right after Shaul's death, if you go back to probably chapter one of our book, that right after Shaul's death, um, the people crown him as king, if I'm not mistaken, right? Let me just go back here. Huh? Before, the Before the rebellion of Avner and everything else that happened, David was crowned as uh, as king back then. Uh, da -da -da -da. David says, should I go to Hebron? He goes to Hebron. It's in chapter 2, verse 4. And the people of Yehuda anointed David as king over Bet Yehuda. And then they, they have. So from that point, when he was crowned over Yehuda in Hebron, that's when his reign begins. The text counts the seven years of strife between him, Avner, Ishboshet, all that goes on there. And at the end of the seven years, after Ishboshet is assassinated, now he has another coronation, and that's where the 33 years is going to begin, because immediately he's going to go to the city of Yerushalayim now, and he's going to start to found his kingdom over everybody. So that's another sort of support that Shaul's 
whatever that he was doing to David was for a very long time because it seems like it started when David was young and he was his art player and which was like seemed like he was young at that right. Time. In other words, uh, when he's when he defeats Goliath, it sounds like he's much younger. He doesn't seem like he would be twenty eight. Which would be the two we don't have an exact number, but like, even a person in their early 20s is pretty young, or, or yeah, right, it wasn't two years. Was two we definitely got the feeling it was longer than that. Yeah, we said the timeline was definitely longer yes. than that. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so let's continue. Where are we? We're in verse six. So now David has to figure out what does he want to do as his first course of action? You become king, you finally recognized over all the Jewish people. What are the first steps that you want to do to really firm up your kingdom in the eyes of your people? So the first thing that he does is he's going to transfer his capital, his stronghold from Hebron, where he's been for seven years, to the city of Yerushalayim. We have to ask ourselves the question, why Yerushalayim? But before we do that, let's read the, first, the next four or five pisukim. These next pisukim are going to be very, very challenging to understand what exactly is happening here. We have to also take a look at parallel Pesukim in the book of Chronicles. And then I'm going to use um, this very nice Koran, uh, Tanakh of the land of Israel, to kind of uh, try to put the pieces a little bit together. So we have what to analyze here. So let's see. The king and his men traveled to Yerushalayim. And at this time, Yerushalayim is not in their control. Yerushalayim is in the hands of one of the seven Canaanite tribes known as the Yevusi. I don't know if you're familiar with that tribe when we pray, right? We say that tribe a lot. So, towards the tribe of the Yevusi who were dwelling in the land, they had control of Yerushalayim and the surrounding area. As David is approaching, they realize David is ready to start up with them. They send to David saying, You are not to come here. Don't challenge us. Now, how to translate this pasuk is a bit of a challenge. Let's go with what's in front of us. I'll read from uh, Rabbi Sachs' translation over here in verse 6. He says, David was told you shall not enter here. Surely even our blind and lame will repel you. Ivrim comes from the word iver, blind. Pischim comes from the word piseach, which means somebody who is lame, someone who doesn't know how to walk straight, right? He says, if you should even be able to remove our blind and our lame, saying, lo yavo David henna. In other words, the standard interpretation, Abarbanel gives this, Radak and others give it, is the Yibusi were mocking David. They were saying to David, you couldn't even defeat us if we lined up our blind and lame to defend you even they would push you back. You could not penetrate our city. So they were sort of uh, instigating and, and taunting David and his men that he would not be successful in defeating the Yibusi. That's one approach that is taken amongst the, uh, amongst the commentaries. I'm going to leave that as our simple explanation. It's the one that most translations have. But I'll double back to it to give you another approach when we compare it to the Pesukim and Divrei Hayamim. So hold tight for just a minute. Verse 7, David, in fact, does capture the stronghold of Zion. That's Yerushalayim. He, Ir David. This is known as the city of David, right? This is one of the two parts of the bigger city of Yerushalayim. <coughs> we'll see that, um, I'll read to you a comment from Rabbi Amnon Bazak, that many commentaries understand that Yerushalayim is actually divided into two parts. There's an upper Yerushalayim and a lower Yerushalayim. One part's called Ir David, one part is called something else. I'll come back to that in a minute as well. Pasuk Chet, first I just want to get the Pesukim under our belt. Pasuk Chet, verse 8. Vayome David bayom hahu. Now the text tells us exactly how David was able to conquer um, the city of the Yibusi, of Yerushalayim. David called out on that day, Kol make Yibusi. Anybody who destroys the Yevusi, the Yigab Batsinor, and reaches to the Tsinor. Tsinor most interpret as the water shaft, or some people say it as a water pipe. What do they have over there? I think in by Rabbi Sachs, he says, he, uh, he says, 
and reaches the water shaft. Anybody who can penetrate the Yivusi and reaches the water shaft, and the lame and the blind who hate the soul of David. For this reason, they say, a blind or lame will not come into the house. You can see that these Pesukim are very cryptic, very, very hard to understand and piece together what they're talking about. I'll read a little bit more, and then we'll try and put it together. David occupied the stronghold. David, and he called it the city of David. Vayiven David Saviv. David then built up the area around it, minham milo vavaita, from the milo and inward. Vayelech David haloch vegadol. David kept growing stronger. Vadonai elohet sevaot imo, and God, the Lord of Hosts, was with him. So, what do, what do you take away from these pesukim? There's a lot of detail here that is kind of hard to put together. In a moment, we'll take a look at the pesukim in Divrei Hayamim. Which relate to this exact, which tell the same story with some slight differentiations that, that are important. But what is the sentiment that you just grabbed from over here? Hashem is with him. Hashem is with David and is helping him to be successful. That's very important for sure. He's fighting against the Yavusi to, uh, to conquer the city of Yerushalayim because David has identified the city of Yerushalayim as his city. That's the place where he wants to build outward his monarchy. Um, David has this back and forth with the Yivusi, who are mocking him with the blind and the lame. And then David basically uses that as motivation and says, I'm anybody who goes ahead and kills all of the blame, the lame and the blind. In other words, he uses that same wording back at them to show them that he's going to overcome them, which is what he's able to end up doing. How this blind and lame kind of play a role in it is, isn't 100% clear. They were using it as mocking. Maybe David's mocking them and taunting them back. But it's still a little unclear. It's still a little hazy. What is this water shift? We're not exactly sure why that's mentioned. Um, and then, yeah, these are some questions that we want to go ahead and answer. But the first question that we want to answer is an important one, just taking a step back, which is, why Yerushalayim? And this is very important for us to answer because David identifies Yerushalayim and Jerusalem forever has become the city for the Jewish people. Why is Yerushalayim so important to David and why did he identify it as his place? Now, to be sure, many of you will say, well, what do you mean? Yerushalayim is our holy city. What's fascinating is the city of Yerushalayim is not once mentioned in the five books of the Torah. If you read the Chamisha Chumshet Torah that was given to us, Yerushalayim is not mentioned at all. Hashem says, I'm going to take you Hashem, to the place where Hashem has chosen. It doesn't ever say that it means Yerushalayim. So if that's the case, why did David, how did David know that it's Yerushalayim? And why does David identify Yerushalayim as the city that he wants to be, where Hashem is going to choose to have his presence? So if you take a look in the paper that I gave you, huh? Ah, so that's one, that's one obviously very important point. The tradition of, of Hara Moria is definitely very important. But I think there were some other factors over here that are important to keep in mind. So I'm going to pull up for us um, this, uh, this nice page over here in the, uh, in the Koran Tanakh. Okay, I'm hoping that, oopsies. Okay, good. Um, and take a look. They're going to use a number of different arguments about why Jerusalem was important. So as conquering Jerusalem was David's first act after beginning his reign over all Israel. In the larger context of Tanakh, the Israelites were commanded to worship at a religious center that the Lord would choose. This center had been associated with Shiloh before its destruction. As a result of David's actions, Jerusalem became the new and abiding religious and political center. But why did David initially decide to make Jerusalem his royal capital, the royal city and capital? After all, he had already ruled in the city of Hebron for seven and a half years. And Hebron was a very religiously charged city, given that it's where our forefathers are buried, Abraham, Yitzchak, Yaakov, the four mothers, Sarad, Karach, Ebedeah. The biblical text does not explicitly answer this question, although Deuteronomy, that's Devarim, requires a central administrative and religious center. It never requires that the center be in Jerusalem. There are several reasons why David might have chosen Jerusalem as his capital. Jerusalem remained an unconquered foreign city in the midst of Israel. 
The preceding biblical references to Shalem, Yevus, and Jerusalem indicate that the city remained in, Je in Yevusite hands despite earlier Israelite attempts to take control of it. So actually before David, there were some other attempts to, to control Yerushalayim, which failed until David was able to come and be successful. Hence, the text tells us that David had Hashem with him. In other words, God would not allow anybody else to conquer without his, uh, without his approval, so to speak. Moreover, David's conquering of the city literally made Jerusalem the city of David, which we call it. That is, Jerusalem became the royal property of David. Um, Jerusalem was geopolitically strategic due to its geographical position. It was on the southern border of the kingdom of Shaul and Benjamin and southern Ephraim. It was also bordering the power bases of David in the vicinity of Bethlehem and Hebron. This is very important. Why did David like Yerushalayim? Because think about David in his position. David saying, I'm from the tribe of Yehuda, and I'm about to take over for Shaul, who's from the tribe of Binyamin. And very easily, we can get into a major tiff, major struggle between these two very important tribes. David decides, rather than having his stronghold in the heart of Judah, in the heart of Yehuda, which is his home tribe, he extends almost like an olive branch to the other powerful tribe, Binyamin, by saying, I'm not going to make my center in the heart of my people and become tribal. I'm going to actually move from my spot to a city that is right on the border between you, Binyamin, and me, Yehuda. What message was David sending by doing this? Let's be one. Let's unite together. This is not about Yehuda on one side versus Binyamin on the other side. Let's not continue the struggle and tensions that are pulling us apart between these two powerful tribes. Let's put it somewhere in the middle. We're right on the border where we can rule for all of the Jewish people to connect them together. That's a very powerful message that David is sending to a tribe right next to him, which neighbors him, which he knows he needs their assistance and their support to say, this is not about your tribe versus my tribe. Very, very important statement by David. Unlike Hebron, which was located much further south in the middle of Yehuda's territory, in the middle of Yehuda's territory, um, the more centrally located capital in Jerusalem allowed better connections to the northern tribes, as well as far neighbors in the west, the Philistines, which were about to have multiple battles against them. So it allowed the Jewish people to have a better angle and a better approach towards fighting and keeping their neighbors at bay. Um, and especially the city of God, and east, the people of Moab and Ammon. In other words, David is also getting a more central location to be able to handle his enemies and his other neighbors on all different sides. These geopolitical aspects are reflected in the trade and marriage alliances made later by Shlomo. So David is choosing this place very, very strategically. Rav Amnon Bazak adds in another very important idea. He says, not only did Jerusalem straddle the border between Binyamin and Yehuda, halachically, the rabbis tell us, it was not granted to any one tribe. In other words, it was not part of Yehuda's territory or Binyamin's territory. It's almost like Washington, D.C., Lahavdil, right? The way Washington, D.C. is like its own district, right? Even though it's part of the state of Maryland, it doesn't belong to Maryland. It's its own thing because Washington belongs, belongs to the American people, for everybody. Similarly, Lahavdil, Yerushalayim, the rabbi said, lo was not divided amongst the tribes. So no individual tribe gets claimed to that very important city or where it is, right? It belongs to all of Am Yisrael. Another very important statement that David was making by that. Had he kept it in Hebron, it would have given uh, other people a sense of this kingdom is really favoring one tribe over the other tribes. Jerusalem, not to mention, was closer to the north. So now it gave uh, David better access to the other tribes to make them feel welcome and a part of his kingdom. Jerusalem was economically prosperous as a result of its proximity to trade routes and reasonably well def defended by its natural topography. It is also generally well situated for settlement and agriculture because of the relatively high amount of rain that it receives each year. However, the existence of a permanent settlement in the city of David from, uh, from the early Bronze Age through modern times is not due to the rain. Rather, it relates directly to the presence of an abundant water source there, the Gihon Spring. And that's where the water shaft comes in. The water shaft was the way that they drew water from the Gihon Spring to give to the entire uh, city of Yerushalayim. So unlike a lot of other cities in Israel, 
which struggle for water and are dependent on rain, Jerusalem uniquely has the Gihon Spring, a natural source of water that they developed through technology to be able to spread that water everywhere, which ensured its economic prosperity. And that's another reason why David chose it as its capital, so that it would be a place that people would want to come to, right? Yeah. And some independence, yeah. Of course, that's what he's going to come to a little bit. But it's a combination of factors, right? Of course, of course, in the end of the day, the religious significance of Yerushalayim, having been the Temple Mount where Abraham Avinu sacrificed uh, Yitzchak or attempted to sacrifice Yitzchak, and that becoming the site where Hashem designated is going to be the place for the Beit HaMikdash, as we'll soon see, but never, additionally, we see that Yerushalayim had a lot of other factors that made it a great spot for it to be the capital city, which David probably was aware of as well. David knew all about the religious aspect of it at that time. And you would you would guess that you would guess so. You would guess so. That it wasn't given to one because maybe that's not the biggest. Yeah, I I would guess so. That's 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 what my my guess would be. That spring, together with its surrounding Middle Bronze Age fortifications and existing agricultural fields and orchards, must have been a major factor in David's decision to take the city. Finally, he says Jerusalem was spiritually significant due to the Abrahamic connections to Malki Tzedek and the binding of Yitzchak on Mount Moriah. The latter connection is made explicit in the Book of Chronicles, which indicates that Shlomo built the house of the Lord on Har HaMoriah. So it's clear that there was some kind of tradition that was passed down that this should be a center. Now, you could have argued that maybe David would have the Beit HaMikdash in Jerusalem, but that his capital city would be somewhere else. Maybe he wanted to have his capital city somewhere different. The fact that he had all of these factors to combine the two and to say, this is where it needs to be that my kingdom is founded is significant. And hence, the city is always called by the name of David, that it should be David city. Yeah. It would seem more likely to be the the other way. Like Hashem chose Har Moriah, and then, I mean, you know, it's because it's the best place to be in, in, in Israel. Like, why? Would, like, it doesn't make sense almost to say like that's where that's where the Beit Hamikdash was going to be. Oh, coincidentally, because you know what I'm saying. Well, you don't get what I'm saying. Meaning, like, you're saying what came first, the chicken or the egg? You want to say the spirituality, the spiritual aspect is what comes yeah, first. But, yeah, because Hashem is going to obviously want to make the place that it's going to be. But did, that necess- but did that necessarily dictate that David would have to rule from there? Well, yeah. When you look at, like, like I was just recently... Because nobody else decided... But nobody else decided to move it. Shaul didn't decide to go to Yerushalayim. Uh, yeah, okay. David, right now, right now, we don't know what he is. We don't know where he is right now at this moment. True. He's planning to build it. True. So he wants to be in that area, and it's right. Like right. I don't know. It just seems a little like too coincidental to say it's like the perfect place. And oh yeah, by the way, like no, I, right. I, you want to say it's it's that, and then that makes it the perfect place. But I think the factors all. I don't know. For me, they kind of go hand in hand. I think it's uh, it's significant that is not in a spot which is disastrous for people to live, where where a kingdom cannot go. It actually makes it the perfect spot. Yeah, yeah, I agree with you. I'm saying it makes it. I think the question that they want to say is what triggered David now to start his kingdom to go directly to Yerushalayim, to be this first spot, right? I think it was, I think it was a strategic play. It was definitely a spiritual play. Why him? Why was he the first one to think of this, to go ahead and do it? I think it was for all of these different reasons combined. The spiritual reason certainly being at the top. Right, I, I think that that. But he seems mentioned like as a footnote, as opposed to like. Starting yeah, maybe like, maybe I wouldn't have written it like that, but I think I it's know. yeah, yeah, okay. It's like I want the place to have a little more significance than like, oh yeah, it's a good source of water, like. No, but that's what makes it a place where people can exist. Because if it's not a good source of water, then it would be ridiculous to place your right. You're saying going the other way. I understand what you're saying. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, okay, so that's a little bit about the city of Yerushalayim. Let's back up for just a minute and try to understand what exactly happened in this conquest of um, of the Yivusi, right? Like, how did this actually take place? Because it's a little cryptic, right? David says, anybody who will come and take over the Yivusi, but it doesn't say who actually did it or what the reward was for it. 
We don't know what's going on with the blind and the lame and how this happens. How does the water shaft play a role in it? The, the text doesn't give us really a lot of detail. So to help us out a little bit, I'm going to challenge you now to turn all the way to the end of your Tanakh. All the way to the end of your Tanakh. If you have my Saks Tanakh, it's page 1867. We're going to Divrei Hayamim, the book of Chronicles 1, chapter 11, Perek Yud Aleph. See if you can gather that. Okay, I'll pull it up over here for our viewers on the Zoom. We're going. If you do this, then he doesn't finish the statement exactly. We always have problems with people who make those statements and then finish it with "you'll get to marry." Right. What's going to happen at the end of it? Exactly. Page 1867. Okay, this is the book of Chronicles one, Divrei Hayamim Aleph. Perek Yud Aleph, chapter 11, um, verse 4, Pasuk Dalet. Okay, now the book of Chronicles, for anybody who's not familiar with it, is, as its name details, it's a reiterating of all of the stories that took place, how, you know, the lineage, it's basically, Esther, if you want to make your family tree, yeah, <laughs> book of Chronicles is where you want to go, because that's going to give you the full picture of people and how many children they have and how many wives did they have and basic um, you know, events that took place and transpired. It's also very valuable to us because events that sometimes as in our case are not fully detailed in the place where they're originally written are often paralleled in Divrei Hayamim and you can compare the stories together. And watch, when you read this story, there's a number of differences that happened um, from the way it's recorded in our text in the book of Shemuel. What were you saying, Esther, the, the timing? Yeah, even the timeline. Yeah. At the beginning of the book, it gives you, uh, you know, the timeline of what it looks like. The Divrei Hayamim is going to be the timeline of everything, basically, because it starts all the way at the very beginning. In fact, the first the first, pas, the first word of the book of, Div, of Divrei Hayamim is Adam. It talks about Adam Harishon, right? It gives you the whole lineage. So, yeah. Who wrote the book of Divrei Hayamim? It would stand to reason that it traces to the destruction of the Beit HaMikdash. So it's, it stands to reason it's probably someone like Ezra, Ezra Nehemiah, who writes Divrei Hayamim. If I'm not mistaken, the Gemara in Baba Batra writes that it was Ezra. It's got to be a very late person who can recap all of that which has gone on. So let's read how Divrei Hayamim does it. We've got to read five or six Pesukim here. It says, Vayelech David v'chol Yisrael Yerushalayim. David and all of the Jewish people went to Yerushalayim. He Yevus, which was by the Yevusi. And that's where the Yevusi were dwelling in the land. The members of Yevus told David, do not come here, which is the same as what he said to us. But notice something that's missing. David in the end captures Mitsudat Sion, which is Ir David. What is not mentioned here? The blind and the lame. That is not brought up over here. Vayomer David, David said, how did it happen? He said, Kol make yevusi barishona, anybody who destroys the Yevusi first, will be a leader and a our text. So no reward was given in our text. Who ends up doing this? Vayal barishona Yoav ben Siruya Vahilerosh. Who was the one who in fact conquered the city? Yoav. And that's why Yoav became David's general. Now we understand how Yoav got to that position. He got to that position because he conquered the city of Yerushalayim on behalf of David. And that's why he was promised that job. That, by the way, was not mentioned in our text that Yoav was the one who did it. So neither the reward nor the person who fulfilled the, the promise were mentioned in our text. Vayeshev David Bamtsa, David sat in the fortress. Alken Karulo Ir David, that's why they called it the city of David. Vayiven Ha'ir Misaviv Min Hamilo Be'ada Saviv, David built up the surrounding area from the Milo. Vayoav Yechaye et She'ar Ha'ir. And Yoav repaired the rest of the city. Vayelech David Haloch Vegado, David grew great and strong. Vadonai Tsevaot Imo, and the Lord of God of hosts was with him. That, te- that part of the text is there. So this story in Divrei Hayamim, paralleling our story, fills in some of the blanks. It helps us know who did the act. It was Yoav. What the reward was, which was not mentioned, that he became a Rosh and a Sar. 
But at the same time, it also leaves out some details that were in us. The lame and the blind are not mentioned. The water shaft is not mentioned. And so you kind of sometimes have to combine the two stories to put all the different details together to figure out what's going on over here. Now, you can take a guess. Why do you think the text in Shemuel does not mention that Yoav was the one who did it and he was rewarded by being a general? Why might the text decide to omit that? Hmm? It says chronologically, though. What? Yoav was somebody who was important. It's possible that we think of him as the general because of what happened later, but he was still somebody that was important in the camp. Eventually, it seems like he was grown to be general because of this. Yeah, but he may have already occupied a very important title. Didn't necessarily call the general. I don't know. It would seem not. It would seem not. Ah, so remember we talked about how when Yoav killed Avner, David said, I'm not going to seek retribution. These guys are very tough. Well, it works out for him, right? Because Yoav ends up being the one to conquer the city of Yerushalayim on his behalf, right? A little bit of personal redemption. Yoav definitely helps David out. But now you might understand why the book of Shemuel leaves out his name. Why? Because we're not entirely in love with Yoav right now at this point. Right? In other words, the, we'll let the book of Devere Hayamim tell us what he did. Right now, Yoav was undermining David's ability to unite the kingdom. So while he does something good here to redeem himself, we're going to leave out his name because right now he's not a number one favorite standing with, what the, with whatever is going on over here. I wanted to read with you, if, you, if you'll indulge me, um, on the second half of your page in front of you, it discusses the idea of the water shaft, which I don't know how many people like the like archaeology so much, but this is very, it's fascinating because you can actually visit this in Yerushalayim, and the next time you go, uh, I'd encourage you to do so, and you'll see a little bit of what we do go to life. We've said that a few times that we should have a class chip, yes. But understanding what's going on in Yerushalayim is very important, right? Huh? Yeah, yeah. you want to see what's going on over here. Now, it looks a little different today than it did way back when. But uh, take a look at what he says over here about the Tzinor, the water shaft. How did David conquer Jerusalem? The answer is uncertain. Chronicles 1, 11, 6, as we just read, indicates that Yoav was the first to go up to take the city, which was why he was made a leader and an officer. But this parallel passage does not discuss the method used to conquer the city. By contrast, our verse does not refer to Yoav, but it does indicate that David told his men the city should be conquered by reaching the Tsinor, which is often translated as water shaft. While some academic scholars have offered other possibilities for translating Tsinor, cognates of the word in Ugaritic, which may be understood as water pipes, as well as the Hebrew text of this verse, the traditional text and the Dead Sea Scrolls, and its translation into Aramaic, Greek, and Latin seem to support the water shaft interpretation. So most commentaries explain this tsinod was some kind of a water shaft. In the 1860s, Charles Warren, the famous British military officer and Palestine Exploration Fund Explorer, became the first person to conduct an archaeological excavation in Jerusalem. Um, and Warren's investigation of Jerusalem's water systems were among his most important discoveries. In these expeditions, he discovered what would later become known as Chizkiyahu's Tunnel. I don't know if anybody's visited there. Yeah, Chizkiyahu's Tunnel and the Warren's Shaft System. Okay, Chizkiyahu's Tunnel is very significant because Chizkiyahu's Tunnel was a water system that was bringing water to the, into the city of Yerushalayim. And there was a big discussion when, when Hezekiah got into a tussle with the Assyrians, when the Assyrians were coming, there was a discussion about closing off the, the, they were nervous that the Assyrians would enter into the city through the water tunnels. So Hezekiah had a, had a choice, he had a debate, close the water tunnels, but that would essentially starve his own people of water, or leave them open and risk the Assyrians coming in. And Hezekiah had to make a very, very tough decision. We'll wait till Melachim Bet to give you that to give you that answer a little bit. Yeah, um, and then the war the war in Shefs. His Kiao's tunnel or the Siloam tunnel is an eighth century BCE rock cut tunnel that brought water from the eastern side of the city of David, where the Gihon Spring is located, which was one of the reasons why we said the Yerushalayim was significant because it had the spring of Gihon to the pool of Shiloach Siloam in the southwestern side of the city of David. The Warren Shaft system was an earlier rock cutout step tunnel that allowed protected access to the Gihon Spring. 
This system was originally constructed in the Middle Bronze Age and probably continued to be used until the destruction of Jerusalem in 586 BCE. From circa 1800 BCE until the construction of Hizkiyahu's tunnel in the late 8th century BCE, the Warren Shaft Tunnel was the primary way to bring up water into Jerusalem. After that, the Pool of Shiloach served as the main water source. One must distinguish between the entire Warren Shaft system in existence at the time, which includes the Long Step Tunnel, the fortified passageway, and the Spring Tower over the Gijon Spring only recently exposed in its entirety, and Warren Shaft itself. In other words, there's different pieces to this system and how it works. There's the shaft itself, then there's the tunnel system that gets into it. Warren and uh, where am I? Warren and others after him identified the shaft as the Tsinor. This was the Tsinor we're talking about, suggesting that Yoav climbed up through the shaft to conquer the city. However, current information indicates that the vertical shaft was probably not part of the original water system and was only discovered and opened in the late 8th century BCE during the construction of Chizkiyahu's tunnel. If so, Yoav could not have climbed up this particular shaft because it would have been blocked at the time. Nevertheless, it remains possible that the heavily fortified Middle Bronze Age water system may be related to the Tsinor. If, in fact, this term does refer to, refer to a water shaft, it might indicate some vulnerability in the Middle Bronze water system that would have allowed Yoav to sneak in and lead to the, conquer, to the conquest of the city. So it's fascinating how you could see how these things sort of work, how having a water shaft system to get water in could also be a way to kind of get in. And David already was cognizant of this and already de 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 determined the military strategy of who's going to be the one to go in and to reach the Tsinor to be able to enter the city. And once that happened, it would be very easy for them to go ahead and to conquer the city. Maybe that's why the Yivusi were so confident in themselves. Oh, uh, there's no way even the blind and the lame can protect you from it because there's no way you're going to find to penetrate the city. Little did they know that David already had insight how to get in through the Tsinor and already had instructed Yoav what it was that he went to do. I find it, I don't know how thrilling this is for everybody, but I find this to be pretty fascinating, right, about how this, uh, about how this works. And it sheds light how modern day discoveries can really shed light on what we're talking about, you know, so many thousands of years ago. The last thing that we want to uncover and then we'll move forward was what was going on with the lame and the blind. We gave the simple interpretation that, um, that uh, it's, it was a mockery from the part of the Givusi towards David, even our lame and our blind can connect the city. And then David said, yeah, we're gonna go in and we're gonna take the lame and the blind that you so you know, t told us could defend us, who are Sinu'e David, who are hated by David. It's interesting, it's interesting you should bring up Mephi Boshin, who was a cripple. There's a nice discussion over here. I didn't, I didn't give it to you, but this is no way, um, he says over here, like, uh, disrespect to handicapped people. Like, that's not what's going on over here. Because if anything, David is going to take care of Mephibosheth, Shaul's handicapped son. He's going to have a very strong connection and relationship with him. David's going to really help him out. So David is not somebody who lacks compassion for people who are, who are disabled in any way. They actually bring some very nice evidence that, that um, for people who like Chesed and you know, do things with handicapped people, um, that handicapped people actually had a very strong place in society way back when. I'll read to you a few from this paragraph. It says, Vari various texts from ancient Near East point to a general positive attitude regarding the incorporation of disabled individuals within the society. People afflicted with a disease or disability would often end up working at a temple, ironically, because they're not allowed to work in our temple because a uh, blemished Kohen is not allowed because their immediate family could no longer take care of them. So in other words, the temple would take them in almost like an orphanage. Also blind people appeared in ration lists of institutional households and were recorded as having regular jobs like a miller or a gardener. And a Babylonian text mentions a slave who was a crippled leather worker. Um, some texts depict disabled people in a military context, which makes sense with what we're saying over here. In the Sultan Teep tablets from the late Assyrian period, a text mentions the cripple and the weakling in a battle. In the Ugaritic Kurda epic, the poet, to show how exempted people in the city of Huber joined Kurda's army, include the sick and disabled volunteers. Even the ill will be carried in bed. Even the blind will blink his way. So it seems like they did incorporate disabled people into society. So this wasn't an attack on them. It was uh, just using them in terms of a parable to sort of mock each other. But there's a whole different approach that the rabbi, well, that he's saying that. 
Be right. Them to tease him, <laughs> but they're very respected people. They have a playlist in society. <laughs> in the battle, I knew you're gonna. I knew you're gonna. You're gonna get me. But at the end of the day, you don't put blind and disabled people at the front to defend your city. Like that's. Uh, yeah, I hear what you're saying. <laughs> Yeah, kind of like that. Which is disrespectful. Right. Which is why you're saying it's not. I'm not saying that it's. I'm not saying that it was. I'm not saying that they weren't using it sometimes as a way, like to taunt each other. But in other words, it wasn't as if disabled people were like uh, not considered part of society. They functioned. That's all I'm trying to say. You're not buying it. All right. I did my best. <laughs> A blind person is like a dead person. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a, I just want to give you quickly the rabbi's interpretation to this. They give a whole different approach to this. You know what they say? They say that who are the lame and the blind? That actually um, the lame and the blind were statues that the Yavusi constructed to, um, to parallel Yitzchak and Yaakov. Yeah. To parallel Yitzchak and Yaakov. Why? That's what your book is, isn't it? Very good. To parallel Yitzchak and Yaakov. Yitzchak, we know, was blind at the end of his life. And Yaakov, we know, was hit by the angel and was lame. So the Yivusi constructed images, right? Pesilim Avodazara, to parallel Yitzchak and Yaakov. What would be the purpose of that? Because going back even one generation before that with Avraham, Avraham had made a deal with Eli Avimelech, for those who go back. He made a deal with Avimelech that he would not conquer and take over certain tribes within the land of Israel. And so the Yivusi, to keep that promise uh, intact, a visual aid to that, constructed these two to send the message to Yitzchak, you can't conquer us, to send the message to Yaakov, you can't conquer us. And they held these, they actually placed them at the entranceway of the city as a, as a uh, message, so to speak, to the Jewish people, don't come here. Maybe that's why they say to David, Lo David, you don't have permission. You don't have the right to come here. Don't forget the deal and the treaty that your ancestors had went ahead and made with us. And that might have been what they were talking about with the Ivrim and the Pistim. And that's perhaps why it took so long until David for anybody to conquer the city of Yerushalayim. Previous uh, regimes tried to conquer it. Many people stayed away from it because they were nervous about this treaty and this Berit that we have going back to way back when. Now the only question, so that's the only question that I don't know that it's resolved. Maybe Lisa has something in her book, but that's the only question that I don't have resolved is, so why now was David given the permission or the access or the right to be able to defy that treaty for this purpose? That I'm not 100% sure. Well, what? Was the treaty originally for future generations? So it, in the treaty that Abraham made, it says, which means my grandchild and my great-grandchild, which means that it could be that there was a time limit on the treaty and that time limit had passed. Lisa, what did they say over there? More than 700 years had passed, my son and my grandson. There you go. That's what it is, right? It, right. Right. The son Yitzchak, the son Yaakov, and now we're already too far later. That's a good point, right? What that are sinu nefesh David, yeah. Right. Yeah, it's not that would not be clear how that would necessarily fit um, with what David was saying over here. Yeah, it, it makes sense also when they say al ken yomru iver upiseach lo yavo el habay. No one who's blind or also no one who's blind or lame may enter the house. How does that whole pasuk eight? Pasuk eight becomes a hard pasuk to fit into that Midrashic thing. So you probably need a combination of, uh, of commentaries to really make sense of all of the Pesukim. There isn't one, maybe there are multiple layers of how the story kind of fits together to, to sort of make sense of it. It's fascinating stuff. There's a lot of different things that, that come in here archeologically, uh, culturally. When you first read um, that the can't come into the bay, I thought that that meant that they won't be allowed to live in the country. Right, we do have a concept that those people are not allowed into the bay. But that might be that might be an explanation. In other words, because the Ivrim and Pischim were Sinu David, it's why it always stands as a. Hashem usually brings 
you know, as a, as an orphan or a widow, that's always right. the first person's worry. Yeah. Right. So it's not that Hashem's not worrying about it, but in terms of their service in the temple, they're precluded from being able to do that because only certain people are allowed to serve. Mm-hmm. That's why there's a city of people there with Sin- Sinu'e versus San'u. Like maybe there's no, but maybe it's like there's no. Right, like it's so other way, like, mm. the other the written way would be san'u, right? They they meaning san'u nefesh David, who hated nefesh David versus sinu en nefesh David, whom David so hated them. The difference between san'u and sinu is who's the hater? Um, no, that's not how I would read the kriyuchtiv in this case. The Kriyuchtiv is saying, Sanu Sinu'e. In other words, David's hate for them is only because of the hate that they had for him. Okay. That it went that it went that way. It's a lot of layers you could peel off over here. You could probably do this even further if we want, you know, if, if you want deeper and deeper. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, in the remaining time, maybe we have another five, eight minutes or so. Um, let's try and read through the rest, the, the remainder of the chapter. Um, so step one to David fortifying his kingdom was getting Yerushalayim, which is how he, which is what he does. Now he makes an alliance with somebody else who's going to be uh, a very important figure to know throughout the relationship with David and his son Shalomo. Verse eleven: By Shlach Hiram Menach Tzor Malachim El David, Hiram, the king of Tzor, the king of Tyre, sent messengers to David together with Vaatze Arazim with cedar trees. Uh, logs, the harashe etz and carpenters, the harashe even kir and stones masons, vayivnu bayit the David, and they built a palace for David. So Hiram, as a token of uh, of peace and an and alliance with David, sends a massive gift to David that they're going to build David a palace. This palace that was built for David will later be the motivation that David will have to build the Beit Hamikdash, because David will say, "How is it that I have?" a beautiful palace with logs and cedar and everything. And the Aaron, which he's going to bring back to the Mishkan in the next chapter, is in uh, in a temporary home. That's going to be his motivation for building the Beit HaMikdash. Why is Hiram and, and them? Um, it's not clear. This is his first time on the scene. He recognizes that David's powerful and he wants to uh, he wants to have it be on his good side. It's not clear. It probably has multiple motivations. A, he could be very, he could be very idealistic in the type of kingdom of David. He might say, "This is my neighbor. I want to make sure to have him on my side. He's a valiant warrior, and I don't want to get involved with him." You know, this could also be a business transaction. Hiram is known uh, up north for his cedar trees. We'll see that Shalomo will call on him to uh, to help him build the Beit Hamikdash, and Hiram will prosper uh, well in, in economically because of that alliance as well. Uh, With all of this, David now knew, it was clear to him, that God had established him as king over the Jewish people, and had exalted his monarchy, because of his people of Israel. Rav Amnon Bazak proves, by the way, that this event of the palace happened much later on. It could not have happened right after David became king. Because if that's true, David is, becomes king. That means another 33 years for David to finish out his kingdom. Plus the kingdom of Shalomo, which to get Shalomo before he built the Beit HaMikdash was another 31 years before Shalomo builds the Beit HaMikdash. So between the 33 years of David and the 31 years of Shalomo is 64 years. Says Rav Bazak, that generally was way beyond the average uh, length of monarchy of any one king. So to say that Hiram did this at the very early part of David's monarchy is probably not the case. It probably took many years, maybe over a decade, before Hiram reached out in this way and ended up building the palace. Why is that significant? What it means to us, according different events that did not necessarily occur in chronological order here, but that all have to do with David's foundation for his kingdom in this chapter. This is the chapter, chapter five, which discusses David's fortification of his monarchy. And that's really the most important thing. That's why a lot of different events that are taking place here are not happening in chronological order. Case in point, we'll read quickly the next bunch of Pesukim. David has more children. This did not all happen right after he took took over the 33-year period. 
Verse 13, Vaikach David od pilakshim v'nashim Yerushalayim. After he left Hebron, David took more concubines and wives. Achare bo'o mechevron. After he came from Hebron, Vaivaldu od David banim u'banot. David had many sons and daughters. Ve'ele shemot ha'yilodim lo b'Yerushalayim. This is a list of the children that were born to him in Yerushalayim. Shamua v'shovav v'natan v'shlomo. So it records the birth of Shalomo. Now, the birth of Shalomo didn't happen right now. It happened a little bit later on. We didn't even read about Batsheva. We didn't even get into that whole thing. So they're just preempting it to us, right? So it lists for us all of the children that David had as in Yerushalayim. Going back to our previous chapter, or the maybe chapters before, when it listed earlier children, what's the point of listing children for a king? His continuity, that's part of his fortification of his kingdom, because it means that these are the ones who are going to take over uh, afterwards. And it's significant that Shalomo is mentioned here because he will really be the one that takes over. Concept of having this many Pilekshim. Yes, yes, not correct. Not the average judge does not have so many concubines and have so many children. That's something that's unique to the stature of the king. And that's something that kings did to firm up their rule, for sure. Um, the next few Pisukim discuss battles that David waged at this point uh, and beyond with the Pilishtim. And we know the Pilishtim have been the arch enemy of the Jewish people throughout David's earlier period and now obviously in his reign. So another thing about fortification is beating battles against the people whom you've had a lot of history with, right? Let's not forget that Shaul was put to be king. One of his purposes was to defeat the Pilishtim, which he was unsuccessful at doing. David will be very successful at it. We'll read these quickly. Verse 17. The Pilishtim heard that David was coronated as king. And they immediately come to seek David. They're going to fight against him. Notice how they never fought against him in his seven years that he was ruling in Hebron. Because he wasn't the undisputed king. They were, had a good relationship with him probably. The minute he becomes the ultimate king, now they're going to come and attack him because they're nervous about David's power. David David hears that the Pilishtim are coming and he goes down to the fortress. the Pilishtim come, and they spread over the valley of Rifaim. If you're wondering where the valley of Rifaim is, I'll show you a very, very quick. Um, here it is. Uh, no, was that it? No. What? It's the street in Israel. Emek there might there probably is a street that's named that that's named that, huh? But here I'll show you the uh, I'll show you the map if you want to see it. Oh God, God, here it is. Right. So Jerusalem is up here, okay, and then right below it, a little bit southwest, is the Rifaim Valley, which leads into Nahal Sorek, the Sorek Stream. And that's more, the Sorek stream is where the Valley of Elah is. That's where David defeated Goliath. So right southwestward is the Emek Rifaim, very close to Jerusalem. So remember we said one of the things about Jerusalem was it had an open window into the direction of the Pilishtim. That's what allows David now to have a head-to-head -head combat with the Pilishtim. Today, by the way, this is very nice terrain. This is where the modern day train is. That valley, because it's a very, very easy, very uh, straightforward terrain, a very easy valley to navigate. Verse 19, God, David seeks out God's counsel and says, Should I go to fight the Pilishtim? Will you give them into my hand? God says to David, Go. I shall surely give the Pilishtim into your hands. Notice how despite David's previous successes, he still takes nothing for granted. He's still asking Hashem every time he's ready to wage war to ensure that Hashem is going to be there for his success. He's probably doing it, it phrases it that way, but he's probably doing it through um, the Kohen Gadol. No, he's probably doing it through the Urim Vitumim, through the Kohen Gadol. They don't like me as two questions together. Um, that is true. I didn't notice that. It sounds a little bit though like it's one question. Should I go up? Will I be successful? Hmm. We don't find we find that he asked before he went to Hebron. We don't see that he asked before he went to Yerushalayim. 
But that seemed to be a mandate that he was maybe confident in. He already knew that that was what he was supposed to do. Here he's not sure about waging war against the Pilishtim. Um, I don't know about the two questions. I got to look into the two questions and see if this is maybe one. And then I guess also to Sarah's point, why didn't David ask God about going to Yerushalayim? Maybe he had confidence already that he knew that was something that he needed to do. Two interesting holes that I have to do a little bit more research on. That's what happens when you study Navi. You're always going to have things that goes in. I didn't even notice the double question, by the way. That's excellent that you noticed that. I didn't even think about that. So maybe they maybe asked it in two separate questions. Yeah, but then you would expect maybe some kind of a... Yeah, so it's possible that the text... It's horrible because he knows that, he's, that he has Hashem's blessing, so... Hmm, but then why would it tell us that he asked it? No, no, I'm not saying that. I'm saying that by saying, should I go up and pray to this team? He's almost... Also saying, and am I going to win? But obviously, Hashem's not going to say, yeah, go fight and then lose. So he's saying that, meaning like, will I win is synonymous with, will I go up? I like um, I like Sarah's answer to the idea. I don't know, at least as I know who said it, but that the idea that maybe maybe the text just phrases it as one as two questions simultaneously, but really, there was an in-between, there was a back and forth. In other words, really, maybe it was, and God said, Ale. And then he said, and then he answered, So it's possible that that's how it was conducted. And the text, just for sake of putting it together, of running through it, makes it a little easier for us to see. Either your answer or Grace's answer, I think, are, are both decent ones. Verse 20, David David marched to a place called Baal Peratzim. We'll see in a moment why it's called that. David David uh, defeated them. And he said, God made me breach my enemies. Like going through water, like a breaking through a dam. That's why David called the place Baal Peratzim, a place where he was able to break through the fortress of his enemies. Verse 21, the, Pilish, the Pilishtim abandoned their Atzabehem. The word atzabehem is a derogatory euphemism for their idolatry, for their idols. Mm-hmm. Atzabehem comes from the word atzuv, like etziv, which means sad or, or, or downtrodden. In other words, it's calling their idols like sad, like nothing. So the Pelishtim brought their idols to the battlefield and then abandoned them when the Jewish people were beating them. David And David and his men carried them off to destroy them. Verse 22, the Pelishtim were determined. They went again to try and beat David. And once again, they spread out by Emek Refaim. Round two. Verse 23, God, David does again. God, David asks God. God says to him, don't go up. Now, he doesn't say don't go up because he's going to lose. Grace, maybe this is to your point that sometimes going up and losing might actually be two different things. God says, don't go directly at them. Here's what you're going to do. This time, says God, I want you to go around them. I want you to come from behind. And I want you to confront them at the Bechaim trees. And when you hear the sound of marching on the tops of the Beroshe Bekaim, at the tops of the Bekaim trees, as Teherat, then go into action. Because that's when God went out in front of you to destroy the camp of the Pelishtim. So God wants it to be more clear this time. You're not going directly at them lest maybe David and his men start to get a little arrogant that they're the ones defeating. God says, go from the back, wait to hear the signal that I'm going to give you, that you know I'm going out in front of you, and then you can go ahead and go. Verse 25, as David, can. David follows God's way, as God commanded him, and he's able to route the Pelishtim from Geva all the way to a place called Gezer. So we see... David's success in battle because he follows God's instructions, which for us who have learned Shemuel Aleph know, it's a direct contrast to the way God, the way Shaul dealt with God. Shaul, who had trouble following God's direct instructions within the battle plan, is not the problem that David is having. David is following it, and that's why he's successful. So we see that David establishes his capital city. He has children to have his continuity. And he's successful in battle, all of which 
strengthen and fortify his monarchy as the undisputed leader of the Jewish people. The last and final missing piece, which is going to be now in the chapter six is David establishing a Beit HaMikdash or a central place of worship. The next chapter is gonna talk about David bringing the Aron HaKodesh back to the city of Yerushalayim to establish it as the religious center of the Jewish people. That's gonna be perhaps David's most glorious achievement, but it will come with some struggles, no, uh, no doubt. Um, but that's really uh, very, very important to understanding David's monarchy uh, as a whole. So now we have a fortified kingdom. We will see in chapter six what goes on as David brings the Aron back, which was confiscated ooh, all the way back when. And we still haven't gotten it back into the center. We'll see how that uh, turns out for David. Questions, comments, thoughts? Okay, very good. Enjoy.